about uh, charge exchange and comments. Yes, and is that on? Okay. Um, Colin, actually, Conrad uh, introduced it this morning, and uh, I got to show, uh, have the have the pleasure of showing you the results of uh, all the work that we've done on comets. Um, see, there's only the first slide worked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, the, the reason for that is is, um, is simple. They are they are really nice laboratories for, for charging stations. Um, they're relatively nearby, um, typically at one AU from the sun, one AU from Earth. Um, one AU is not an atomic unit. One AU is uh, an astronomical unit, which is the average distance between uh, Earth and the sun. Um, nearby has, has uh, several advantages. Um, it means that they will be bright. It also means that when you're lucky, there, there are spacecraft that can measure the interaction of uh, the, the solar wind. Uh, they can measure the so solar wind in, in the turbulence composition, um, and, and that may apply to a comet. Uh, nearby also means that you can have planetary missions, and nearby there is this relative, but um, I don't see us flying to a supernova right now in the near future. It will be fun. Um, <laughs> they are relatively well understood, and I will, uh, I will explain that what I mean with that later. Um, other nice things, um, or, 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 or factoids more, is that they have a very large spatial scale, so that in principle you can, um, well, you can also use your images. They're not point sources. There's no magnetic field, so that their interaction resembles that of, of planets um, um, without magnetic fields, uh, like Mars and Venus, more, more Venus even than Mars. Um, what is particularly nice is that there's now a, a relatively large sample of comets that have been observed over the years with different instruments, and that gives you a whole range of different physical conditions. You'll, you'll see you have different solar winds, uh, different distances from the sun, different um, heliographic latitudes with respect to the sun, a uh, different composition of both the solar wind and comets. You have um, different activity in comets. You have um, very active comets, which provide a very collisionally thick atmosphere. You also have very collisionally thin comets where, where the, the solar wind could just fly through. There is dust, there is gas, um, and so on. Um, Moreover, comets are just fun. You can do a whole lot of fun things with them. You can you can throw them at Jupiter. <laughs> you can throw them at the sun. You can throw them at Mars. That's kind of nice. <laughs> or you can shoot copper bullets in it, like here, with deep impact. And if you just let them alone, they also fall apart. Now, all of these comets are not just comets. All of these comets have been observed with X-ray telescopes, and they're, 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 um, they all resulted in some really nice results with them. Um, a, a different view on the science that was going on. And so what are comets? Um, for, for, for the best principle here, for, for X-ray astronomers, a comet is just a, a, a cloud of gas, really. Um, so um, what you have, and, and this, is, this is called a, a, a Heiser model, um, in, in the middle of a comet is, is a small nucleus. This is, this is a particularly famous one at the moment. This is the nucleus of uh, 67B, Kurimov Kirsimenko the target of the Rosetta mission. We're currently in orbit, 40 kilometers around this, so about 10 times the, the, the nucleus. Um, um, this picture is taken at a distance of 3 AU. Now what does that mean? That was again the astronomical unit. And if you have a comet in orbit, this is a comet in elliptical orbit, it comes in like this. You can tell that from the tail, which is pointing away. This is the gas tail that's pointing, the iron tail is pointing away from the sun. The other tail is following its orbit, that's the dust tail. Outside of 3 AU, we don't um, expect comets to be very active. It's just too cold there. Water doesn't uh, sublimate. Um, other, other species do, actually. CO, CO2, maybe there. Uh, at these distances, we, we can't really observe comets in X-ray as far. There, there's just too little gas. They're too far away. You're, you're too far away from the sun. Um, it, it all doesn't add up. When they get closer, the comets become more active because they become warmer, and they go again uh, away. Uh, a simple approximation to a cometary atmosphere uh, is, is, is shown here. The nucleus would be here, and gas is flowing out uh, at one of you with about one kilometer per second. Um, uh, it's not bound. Comets have, have too little gravity um, uh, to hold the, the gas that is expanding with a thermal velocity of this one kilometer per second. And the gas is then destroyed by sunlight, UV, uh, UV lights. Um, and uh, 
For example, if you follow this water molecule, it falls apart in, in H, in O, and in OH. Um, CO is more stable under sunlight um, because of its triple bond, and that will typically be ionized rather than um, um, uh, photodissociated. And, and, and every molecule so has its own uh, interaction. What, what is missing from this picture is CO2, and, and with, that, with that you have the three major species, C, CO2, CO, and water, uh, that can be um, um, CO and CO2 can be present up to 30% is what we now know. Um, the picture, of course, in reality is more complex. I already showed you the, uh, the nucleus of, of 67P, which was active at a very large distance, which we, we didn't really expect. We expect it to be much more, more quiet. Uh, the picture is also more complex. This, is, this assumes just a simple uh, isotropic outflow, but in reality, comets are, are really heterogeneous, and uh, water flows out from different spots. This is deep impact data from the infrared. Water flows out from the neck. CO2 seems to come here from this comet. Um, there's, there's ice around it, that's so that little made in the coma, and the picture becomes more complicated. Um, there's a lot of physics in chemistry that is uh, in the coma that's interesting. These are the ones that I want to point out particularly because these are either uh, directly related or somewhat related to the, um, uh, the physics that we're discussing here. Um, the main process in, 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 in the global coma is, is uh, uh, photodissociation and ionization, where, you, as I said, you, you take your water and you produce um, uh, fragments. Hydrogen is also be a fragment. Why I point this out here is that now with Rosetta, we are also able to uh, see a, a prompt emission from this process. However, that has not been modeled really well uh, or, or studied in the laboratory, specifically because processes like this uh, uh, go through forbidden states of oxygen, which live for about 100 seconds. And, uh, uh, the X ray experiments were all diff difficult in the lab, but <laughs> you would need a pretty long detector to do this. Um, so, this, this, is, this is poorly. Um, um, poorly known, and, and it's even worse for other molecules that we now know are important. These are similar photo reactions for CO2, for CO, and O2, again, the major constituents in the in coma, O2, through chemistry, and this process is uh, uh, unknown. And, and that makes it very hard, of course, to interpret observations that we, uh, that we have, images and spectra of these species. Um, so in charging chains, that one is relatively well studied, but again, um, how, so here we've mostly been talking about excitation of the um, the, the electron thief, the projectile, uh, but what happens to the fragment is um, not really well known. Um, this has been studied somewhat for biomedical applications, um, because if you consider your body to be mostly water and you shoot a, 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 um, a, a, an ion projectile through it, you, um, the secondary fragments of water can actually do much more damage than the projectile itself. However, what, what biomedicals are not so interested in is um, uh, visual emission from the water molecule. Uh, this is again much more <laughs> astrophysical <laughs> application. I would really like to know that. <laughs> and another really big one, uh, electron impact dose dissociation. I've spoken um, about some people about this already. There's, there's a large cloud of electrons that are freed by these photo uh, reactions, and they, um, they cause all sorts of harm to the, the cometary gas. They, they, uh, they excite it, they, they destroy it. And again, these rays are, are, are not well known. And if they are known, they are, they are known for just one energy. Uh, which of course doesn't doesn't do the, the physics any justice, as everybody knows here. Um, so th this is really uh, really recent stuff that we're working on with Rosetta and uh, that we're trying to solve. Um, back to the X-rays. How does this work? Um, um, you've seen this picture before. You 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 have this small nucleus there of a couple of kilometers in size. S simply speaking, gas flows out isotropically uh, until it meets the solar wind, which comes in from this way. Uh, when the solar wind first meets the, the outflowing gas, it is slowed down and, uh, and heated in a bow shock. So at a factor of four, it, it loses in, in, in velocity there. So it's coming in at about 500, and it loses a lot of speed there. Uh, the solar wind is going to be further decelerated here by what is called the pickup process. The magnetic fields uh, can pick up the ionized water, heavy molecules, and about uh, if you have a reasonably sized comet, uh, well, reasonably active comet, um, then you, you'll typically have velocities of 50 kilometers per second close to the nucleus. Um, this is then what it looks in X-rays. Of course, I had to mirror it. This is, in projection, you should imagine that this is an umbrella shape. So uh, the, the ions are coming in. They're used up uh, because it's collisionally thick. And then here, there are no more ions at this charge state that could cause this emission. That doesn't mean that all the ions are gone. They're just emitting in a different wavelength. And as you will see, for example, you come into oxygen 7 plus, it becomes oxygen 6 plus, emitting our, our famous uh, X-ray photon, um, this oxygen 6 plus will then again uh, react with another 
uh, molecule where it will emit in the far UV, and so on and so forth. Uh, it would, of course, be more likely if it, this, this ion had chosen to fly here, but uh, I guess this was for illustrational purposes that it should go there. Um, and then this is what you can get, a high energy V of comets. Um, um, if you're going from right to left to, 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 to more indicate our, uh, our interest in here, in the, in the X-ray, you started with the heavy ions, uh, the carbon and oxygen, that have not indicated even, even higher energies here. Uh, what you see in the EUV is uh, helium in different charge states, and there's, there's, there's oxygen 6 plus in lower charge states. When you go to the far UV, you start to see cometary atoms, uh, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, some sulfur. Um, then in optical UV, UV wavelength, you start to see all these molecules um, that also just spoke about. And, uh, and, and, and then you go to uh, even, even lower wavelengths, uh, where you see reflected dust, and, and you, go, you go on and on. Now, this is pretty much an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll be going from high energy to slightly lower energies. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. So, so this is um, a, a picture taken by the SWIFT telescope. And the SWIFT telescope has three instruments, a gamma ray detector, which uh, uh, wasn't much use here, um, an optical detector, and, a, and an X-ray telescope. And um, uh, they're always used, uh, 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 they're they're always on, at this, uh, pointed at the same target. You get, just like with XMM, you get a lot of data for free. And what you see here is now in blue um, that isotropic outflow of, uh, of gas. This is OH emission uh, at about 300 nanometers. And this pointy thing in, in red here is the X-ray emission overlaid to it. So you have the soda wind coming in here. This cup was then uh, uh, collisionally thick to charging stains. All the, all the um, X-ray emitting ions were used up here. And you get these different distributions in, um, uh, as you see in, in the ultraviolet in, in X-rays. Another thing what you can do with, with telescopes like China is uh, photon timing. Uh, this is, there's a lot of information in this plot. So this is called a Temple 1, uh, which was the target of the Deep Impact mission. Um, this, is a, this is a proxy to its gas production, which was made by, by, by Casey. Um, what you see here is a natural outburst. Comet goes back to steady state. It's hit, hit by our spacecraft, and gravity goes back to steady state. Then, um, since the, the, the uh, cometary X-rays are the product of the solar winds and the comet's activity, this is a measure of the solar wind flux. This is simply the, uh, the proton flux. Uh, and you see this, this is very messy. There are a lot of variation. And this here is a, a CME, which is actually uh, captured by SOHO here, a solar telescope, and is propagated towards the comet. And this is the product of those two. And the thin line here is then approximately the X-rays that you would expect. In black, you have channel observations, and in blue, you have swift observations. And what you see is that, that yes, this is a very good description of, of, of what is going on already. You can clearly see that this, this comet was observed during its interaction with the CME, uh, and, and, and this is almost an order of magnitude difference. Um, now, now, when talking about the solar wind, is the, this is a very famous picture um, um, from Ecomas 2003. Um, the solar wind is, 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 a, is a, a, a bimodal flow. Uh, during um, solar minimum, you have uh, it's it's nicely organized between the fast solar wind or the polar solar wind, which, which you get from about 50 degrees, well, 30 degrees uh, of solar latitude and up, and it's the same thing on both hemispheres. And in, around the, the uh, uh, ecliptical plane, you, you have a uh, a slower solar wind, which is which is which is also more variable. So this is fast and fixed, and this is slow and variable. However, around solar maximum, you get something like this, and this is really self-explanatory. It's just a mess. Um, and so this varies along the, the, the solar cycle. And uh, these are all outbursts, uh, um, which may or may not be accompanied by CMEs, coronal mass ejections, and bouts of really hot plasma, where also the, um, the composition of the solar wind will change. Now, another important part of this is that these solar winds have different origins. Um, and, and, and that means that um, because their origins are different, the temperature where they are formed are different, and that's going to affect your ion composition. So then, this is um, um, this is a little bit of an old graph. This was done in 2007. It's it's a uh, um, it was an overview of the different spectra that we took of comets. These are all individual comets uh, observed by Chandra, and we're trying to see if, if there is any <coughs> systematic effect in those. Um, the colors don't really show, but but what is highlighted here are three bands: uh, the low energy band here, um, the oxygen bands, which is oxygen seven and eight, and a band in the middle. And, and, and as astronomers like to do, we were looking at color effects. And if you, if you look at this now, now long enough, what you will see is that um, this oxygen band here 
um, behaves different than the carbon band here. Here we have a lot of carbon, and that's how these, these images are, are organized. Here, here the carbon is high and oxygen is low. Here they're, they're both low, but by, by, um, by here the, the, um, the oxygen is, is clearly higher, and here it's dominating the spectrum and, and, and its carbon seems to have gone away. Um, so what is behind that? Well, I can show you with this. This is a, a plot of um, freezing temperatures. Uh, it's based on an ionization and, and recombination uh, um, rates in the solar atmosphere. And if you do that for, for both um, oxygen and carbon as a function of temperature on a logarithmic scale here, you can see what charge states you have at, at specific temperatures in, um, in, in the solar plasma. And um, yes, again, the colors don't show, but, but above here, I've indicated which for which solar wind type you approximately have which temperature. So, so for the cold wind, so the, the high latitude wind, you can see that most oxygen is going to be in the oxygen 6 plus state with, with a very small fraction of oxygen 6 plus. Then here, carbon, um, most of it is going to be in the 5 plus state. You, you go up a little bit in temperature and different winds, this, this ratio changes, unless you're in the uh, coronal mass ejection regime and all your, um, your so, most of your solar wind will be in carbon 6 plus and so a significant amount of oxygen, 8 plus and 7 plus. So, so when you go back again to this plot, um, this then explains, um, well, let me, let me point out one more thing. So, so even uh, if you go for in the regular soda winds from cold to slow, um, the, the carbon doesn't change much because uh, uh, both of those are visible in x-rays, 5 and 6, and they sit really close to each other. So, so, so carbon emission is, at least at our resolutions at the moment, is, is, is rather insensitive to um, solar wind temperature changes. This is not the case for oxygen. If you are in the wrong kind of, 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 of solar weather, all your oxygen is in, uh, is in the oxygen 6 plus ion, which emits in the far UV, so outside uh, of Chandra's uh, sensitivity. And that's what explains this. This is, is a state with a, where there's almost no highly charged oxygen in the solar wind, because now it all sits in that 6 plus. And this doesn't really change much, but what, what you get so what you get here is that the, the carbon probably stayed rather constant, but it was the oxygen that was varying. You get more oxygen 7 plus was because it's coming out of that 6 plus state where we couldn't see it. And in the end, you even get a lot of oxygen 8 plus, indicating a, a really high freezing temperature. Um, Conrad made a, a really nice overview then on, on, on where it comes from. Remember that we had this, this organization of, of where uh, the wind comes from matters, what kind of wind you have, and um, the, all those indicated in red are at higher latitudes where we'd expect the, uh, the polar solar wind, so a wind that is very oxygen poor. Um, <coughs> however, um, let me show you this. Um, the comets in red are the ones that are all here. So um, with, where we, based on the oxygen 8 plus 7 plus, we expect a higher freezing temperature. So that doesn't, that doesn't add up. Now the reason for that was that all those comets were observed during solar maximum, when you're not talking about this, you're talking about this mess. So there, 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 there are a lot of CMEs going on and the, um, several times a, a day, and the chances that you see one are actually really, really high. Um, the most extreme case of this was um, uh, called Ikea Zang. Um, it, this is the spectrum that we found there. There are almost no features visible. It's, it's a very bland spectrum at um, the, the, below the one kilo electron volt. And um, we've always believed that there, there, there are many iron lines that really fill in the spectrum and giving our resolution, and there's just nothing left to see. Uh, what was very interesting, though, were the lines here above uh, one kV, between one and two. And um, uh, those were identified <coughs> as um, well, the neon ones. They were seen before, but magnesium and silicon were not seen before. This, this has been summarized in a paper by um, Ian Ewing. However, going back again to this familiar plot, but now with lots more colors, <laughs> um, this is silicon, this is magnesium, and of course they, they have a lot of different charge states, um, and, and they're very sensitive to temperature. Um, now, the, 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 um, the regime that, I, I can't see, you see the color, but nope. <laughs> so, at typical temperatures again, that would end somewhere here, around a million million degrees Kelvin, and there's no way you're going to get those charge states in the normal solar wind, even not in a CME, that's, that's not physical. And uh, Brad has discussed this in a really nice paper recently where, where he, uh, he explains this as a reflection of a solar flare by uh, potentially um, a very small cometary dust. Uh, so that's, but that's still a little bit um, um, 
work in progress because as a cometary scientist, uh, we, we are not really sure that that kind of dust exists in, in cometary atmospheres. So, so these lines are, are puzzling. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, and we've spoken about this a little bit more, are the soft X-rays, and by those I, I mean those below 300 uh, EV. Um, so in um, a couple of years ago, there was a really nice comet, and it happened to be the one that I showed you before, the one that fell apart. Uh, and um, um, it has the, the, the easy name Sosman Bachmann. Uh, if you write it down 10 times, you finally learn how to spell it. <laughs> and it got really close to Earth, um, 0.1 AU, um, so a tenth of the, of, of the distance of the sun. Now, what, what that means is, is that you know the, um, the solar wind environment with which it, it interacts really well, because we have all these solar spacecraft that measure it. Um, so we really knew what was going into the, in, into the comet, and we had the spectrum. So you would think, like, well, all that is in between there, then is a simple model of the charging stains, and, and, and you can understand it all. Um, so ACE is the satellite that measures the, uh, the composition. Um, these are the ratios, six, C6 plus to O7 plus and C5 plus O7 plus that we derived using it, uh, um, uh, our charge change model, and it doesn't work. There's a factor of 10 discrepancy between those abundances. Um, we, we looked at many different things, like could we blame it on the cross-sections? Could we blame it on the calibration? Um, it's more likely that this, this indeed is the, the charge change emission from all these different species that, that sit there. Um, uh, I show that with this slide again, the, the, the line forest as we now call it. Um, these are normally not included in our model. Um, this is a nice uh, spectrum uh, acquired by CHIPS, uh, Sassinadol, and you, you also see that there's a lot of flux there, um, and it really bleeds into to these carbon lines that you see here, here, and here. So, so interpreting the, the, the Chandra spectrum of comets around that um, wavelength is just very difficult. And um, we, we typically, therefore, um, um, stick to the oxygen lines, which, which are more, um, uh, sit more by themselves and are easier to understand. Um, here again, going back to silicon and magnesium, um, if, you, if you can access those wavelengths or, or those energies, uh, these are fantastically sensitive tem tem temperature probes. By just going a couple degrees back or forth, uh, the abundances of these species changes dramatically. So if you have a high resolution at those wavelengths, you can actually do very sensitive diagnostics of the, um, uh, of the solar wind. Okay, as I said in, in my intro, we're, we're going down in, in uh, energy. Um, the, the extreme UV, the helium, uh, helium is really nice. Why is it nice? Because it has two charge states. Uh, helium 2 plus, helium plus, well, and, and, and neutral. Uh, emission mostly goes to these two lines, so 30 nanometers and 58 nanometers. Uh, in the solar wind, it's completely ionized. There's, there's uh, a very, very small amount of, of, um, of helium plus. Um, it's very abundant. It's the most abundant ion in the solar wind after uh, protons, and it's, it's uh, almost 100 times more abundant than, than oxygen. Uh, there, there are multiple observations. Um, both uh, remote by the Extreme UV Explorer. Uh, a couple of comets were observed, Hilbop, Yukatake, Venus, and Mars. Uh, but there are also in situ measurements by um, the Giotto spacecraft that uh, flew through the atmosphere of Comet Halley in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, and this is, this is what I worked on much uh, in, uh, in, in, on my thesis. Um, the nice thing of, of, of helium then is that by changing the Velocity, the spectrum changes dramatically, and this this is an example spectrum. It's a little bit confusing because what you see here is the uh, the 30 nanometer line in second order, and the 58 nanometer line in first order. Um, 58 is double electron capture, uh, 30 is single electron capture. So this is um, this is helium two plus colliding on water and then varying the velocity. And you can see that at high velocity, the um, single electron capture dominates, but at low velocity, the double electron capture dominates. And if you make this as a simple line ratio, it's really nice to see these orders of magnitude difference. But you also see that it varies really uh, uh, between different gases, so you have to do the experiments. Um, we were also able to compare this then with uh, Giotto measurements. Um, it was a very naive, simple model that I made, but it, 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 uh, order of magnitude you can explain the, the helium uh, to helium plus ratio that was observed by Giotto in the, in the coma. Um, this, this completely ignored any of the plasma physics that a proper model would, would have to include. But um, uh, um, you can see that, that, that now that it is, it is possible to, to, to measure this. Um, again, Rosetta 
has a, a large sweep of plasma instruments and ion uh, instruments, mass spectrometers, <clears throat> and they are actively measuring now the, uh, the development of the coma. At this point, um, the coma is very far away, hardly producing any gas, about two cups of water every second. Um, but people can already see the interaction now with the solar wind. Um, up to recently, the solar wind could hit the, the surface, but by now the coma is starting to produce enough of a gas barrier that is starting to be deflected. This is a paper that they published, a Swedish group published in, um, in Science. And they changed the name of the comet to 67P. Yeah, no, this is still good. Curie wants to get us to make up. That's the name? Yeah. No, nobody actually uses that name at all. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's 67P. You, 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 you can show your comet credits by just saying 67P. <laughs> Um, it's an interesting paper and, and it was very um, applicable. Again, they, they also discuss uh, helium charging stains in the coma as observed through their um, yeah, mass spectrometers, with of course simplified cross sections. Yeah. Further down, um, I've, I've mentioned this several times now in the, in the question sections. The far UV, um, what, I mentioned that oxygen six plus and then oxygen six through emission is the next most abundant ion in the solar wind, and it has a lot of different lines in, in the far UV. Some are brighter than others, of course. Um, um, this is a very broad line, a doublet. Um, there's a lot of science you, you can do with this. You, you, when you have a high enough spectra, spectral resolution, you can probably measure the Doppler shift of those lines, and you can see the solar wind velocity. And as I, I just showed you, it varies through the coma. Um, so so that would be a, a nice um, cycle. The, the one problem with this is, is that we've, um, remote observations have um, not uh, been successful in detecting this line thus far. It's not entirely clear why. <coughs> One problem is, of course, that, that high-resolution spectroscopy is often used as a slip, and that is very critical now where you point this um, at, at the comet, because um, as you saw before, think of the umbrella shape, the nucleus is not necessarily the brightest spot. It may, it may well be a little bit before, uh, before it. Um, people tried this with Hubble, people tried this with Fuse, now they will try it with the UV um, uh, spectrometer on board um, uh, Rosetta, which is called ALICE. Um, and, um, well, I hope that this, this line will finally be detected. Um, another nice thing of oxygen-6 emission, again, is that it is very diagnostic of velocity. Again, this is a line ratio. Um, it's the 11.6 and the 17, so um, uh, that's here. The 11.6. Um, that's this one. The 4P to, to 2S. Um, and as a function of velocity, it changes by, by several, um, by a factor of three. Not as much as the helium lines, but still you could do um, a lot of similar work. This is just based on experimental work that we did in the lab. This is again a spectrum, and you can, that, this is effectively a spectral version of what you see here. Um, first order, um, here are a couple lines in second order here, but also some oxygen-5 ones, which are indicative of um, double electron capture, what we heard about earlier today. Um, High resolution spectroscopy, back to the x-rays. Um, I wanted to put this in because of course this was one of the ideas of the, of, of, of the workshop to, um, to, to, to look a little bit ahead of what we can do. Um, we will see a lot of species that are, 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 are too faint to really uh, contribute to the larger features in x-ray. Um, um, many charts of iron, uh, magnesium silicon maybe, specifically if we go to the lower um, uh, energy bands as I showed where, where I think there's a lot of subtle diagnostics to be done. Um, I'm really excited by this triple singlet ratio. As we heard a lot about that, that's, that should be a very important uh, physical outcome. Um, in in Mars, uh, atmosphere compound found uh, CO2. This would actually be very valuable for cometary scientists. I don't know if the brightness would ever be enough, but um, as I said, we can't measure the uh, CO2 abundance from uh, from the ground. But um, uh, the mixing ratio of CO2 and water ice is one of our um, uh, hot topics at the moment, because it tells you where comets are formed, because they have different freezing points. It would be really funny if you could do this in X-ray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, then the other question is, are there um, um, uh, different um, physical processes that add to the, um, the X-ray excitation? Uh, again, charge exchange obviously is now the, the dominant mechanism, but at the 5 to 10 percent level, there probably are uh, other processes, brand straddling or, or other continuum emission features. There's a wonderful paper by um, Vladimir Krasnopolsky who, who um, elaborately um, explained 10 or 12 different processes and how much they could add. And I explained that why I find this. Um, as the concluding slide, I will put my wish list up again. And uh, thank you for your attention. A couple quick questions. 
Scott. Okay, so jumping to the, the previous slide on high resolution spectroscopy, you didn't define it. Um, is 10 EV going to be enough? Is 5 EV going to be enough? Or do we have to wait for Athena or beyond that? I, th I think the minimum what you should be able to do is to separate the, uh, the, the oxygen 7 lines. And, and, and that is definitely feasible. That, if you want 1 EV. Right, so, but that's, going, that's basically Athena class. No, no, you can do that with Astro H. Yeah, okay. yeah. seventy D will let you can fit it. Well. Okay. Yeah, that, that's right. Eight, five B Five B Thank you. No, won't get down there. Uh, one more question, Basile. Yeah, I, I question about this dependence of intensity of uh, a line. Yeah, as a function of velocity, uh, we should think about the origin of this. Because we don't have a mono velocity stuff here. Even in original solar wind, more important when it's interacting with object here, like atmosphere or something, uh, just field of velocities change here. Yeah. Uh, could you try to apply this averaging, even trivial things like the uh, Gaussian averaging or something? Because it would be a uh, different line ratio, yeah? Yeah. It's a first and second, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe you did it in this case. Yeah. I did it for helium, but never for the heavy ions. For helium, you did it, yeah, I know. Yeah. Second point about this uh, uh, ice, dust, and other issue, yeah. Uh, certainly, classical uh, uh, commentary astronomer couldn't see nanoparticles because they have optical view on this, yeah, infrared, yeah. Uh, because wavelength uh, much larger than size of particles. In this case, for the future, I think, if it's only chance to detect this yeah, particle, it should be x-rayed by one or another means. Yeah. It's, it's just as with the CO2, it would be very funny if the x-ray is really enormous. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's the same way, yeah, in this case. All right, thank you again.